everybody. This is very, very amazing. It seems absolutely surreal to be here with you all in person today after 14 months of quarantine. Today, May 21st, 2021, the anniversary of the Mashpee Wampanoag Declaration of Independence and Colerain's first annual William A. Fest Day. We're so grateful to everybody who made the trip. Everybody who's come out, especially our elders and friends from the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. Thank you to all of our speakers for journeying here. Also to our representatives from the Colerain Select Board, the Library Board of Trust Trustees, all those who volunteered their time towards organizing this event, the West County Kindness Group and the 400 Years Project, and our neighbor Leslie Fraser <laughs> for suggesting that we celebrate Colerain's own William Apes for his role in engineering what has been described as one of the first successful peaceful acts of civil disobedience on U.S. territory. My name is Chelsea Jordan Makeley. I'm the library director here at the Griswold Memorial Library. This is a role that I stepped into two years ago now in response to the question that Robin Wall Kimmerer asks in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, where do you feel the most connected to the earth? I think most of you who live here know the feeling and recognize what a special place this is. Rhonda Anderson from the Inupiaq Athabascan Nation will welcome us and honor this land in a moment here. Whereas my role is to first cover logistical details about our library and where you can use the bathroom. <laughs> 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 Please be advised that the mask mandate is still in effect here. Thanks to everyone for wearing your masks and respecting others. We're not all vaccinated as of yet and some of us have vulnerable loved ones at home. Please be respectful of your neighbors. We've been advised that our speakers can each go maskless when they have the mic. We have two bathroom options for your convenience. There's a porta potty behind the building and an ADA accessible full washroom in the library. We ask you to please enter and leave the library through the rear exit only. On that note, our library is open for only one person or family at a time. We're not able to help you with books, DVDs, and Dremels and so forth this evening. Please come back another time during library hours. We'll be aiming to wrap up in under 90 minutes this evening, but invite everyone to divest from timekeeping as much as it's possible. <laughs> there won't be a period for questions or remarks this evening. We ask you instead to connect with each other for continuing conversations. We do have some time set aside for, for reflection, and maybe you want to say hello to your neighbors then. Distanced, of course. You might have noticed if you're from out of town that you don't have cell service here. Please look for the Wi-Fi network Whip City to connect if you are in need. I'll note that our intent always here at GML is to keep you safe and physically comfortable, though you may encounter some ideas that feel a little unsettling. Please join us in the act of learning in public. A little more about our beautiful and historic library, because you're probably wondering, and it does indeed connect, at least tangentially, to the narrative of William Apes, as I learned in reading Drew's book. The Griswold Memorial Library was built in 1908 as a gift to the town from Joseph Griswold. Please check out the Friends table if you want to learn more about that. They have a, the book 1908 for sale. It is a remarkably interesting read. There have been just nine librarians in that time, including my predecessor, Betty Purrington Johnson, who served in this role for 26 years before me. I feel incredibly privileged to be in this company here with you today. There are two library initiatives that I need to mention in the spirit of William Apes and Colerain. That is to say, liberty and right relationships to land and other people. Yes. And of course, books and learning. First up, the Kindness Reading Project is a collaboration with the West County Kindness Group and we meet every other month to discuss a book. The first book that we read together this year was An Indigenous People's History of the United States by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. And we encourage everyone here to please have a read if you've not done so already. 
You can join the Kindness Reading Project. We're now on to the novel Such a Fun Age, and we'll be meeting on June 23rd at 6 p.m. by Zoom. All are welcome. Second, the Carol Purrington Poetry Collective meets the first Friday of every month at 6 o'clock to share in the love of poetry and honor a Coleraine local who I think had a lot in common with William Apis. Each time we meet, we start off with a poem of Carol's. So this is that now. New stone steps for the farmhouse. Trying them, up and down. Having to admit once again how naive I've been. Thanks again, everyone, and I'm so pleased to introduce our speakers. Rhonda Anderson, whose activism ranges from removal of mascots, water protector, indigenous identity, and protecting her traditional homelands in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge from the extractive industry. Mother Bear, Bear Clan Mother, and Marlene, Woman with Wisdom Lopez of the Rabbit Clan, who've made the trip from the Mashpee Wampanoag and are going to offer a blessing for us today. Joe Curland on behalf of the Coleraine Select Board. Dr. Margaret Bruchak, a performer, ethnographer, historian, and museum consultant, and an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Barry O'Connell, who edited On Our Own Ground, the complete writings of William Apis. Dr. Drew Lopenzina, a professor of early American and Native, Amer Native American literature at Old Dominion University, the author of Drew and Indian's Looking Glass. And finally this evening, we'll hear a song from local singer-songwriter Erica Wheeler. Thank you, everybody. And please lead the way, Rhonda. <clears throat> Chelsea. Chelsea. <laughs> traditionally in my Inupiat language. My enrollment village is in Kaktowik, which is a small village on the Beaufort Sea in Alaska. I have lived in New England for most of my life and currently call Coleraine my home. The land that I am privileged to steward and live on is on the Pecomagon River watershed, which is known as the Green River today. Pecomagon is a Nipmuc word that possibly means clear fishing stream. So I want to start off by recognizing this land that I am a guest on. This land that we are all benefiting from is the Wabanaki Confederacy Territory. Wabanaki means the place where the sun is born every day, making the people of this place the people of the Dawn Land. Tribes historically local to Coleraine would be Sakoki Abenaki, Pakumtuk, Nipmuc, and Mohican tribes. Sokoki means the people who go their own way, and they are still here as a state-recognized tribe in southern Vermont. Pakumtuk is a Pakumtuk, Mohican word, that would translate roughly to people of a narrow, swift river or people of a swift, clear stream. The Pakumtuk sought refuge with the Mohican, Abenaki, and Nipmuc people. 
Nipmuc means people of the fresh water, and they are here as a state-recognized tribe in Massachusetts with a small reservation of land that has never been ceded or out of tribal hands. And Mohican translates to people of the waters that are never still. That's in reference to the Hudson River. War, genocide, dispossession, and colonization that pressed the Pecumtuck to seek refuge with neighboring tribes also pushed the Mohican, Stockbridge, and Muncie bands west in the late 1700s through 1800s to Wisconsin, where they have a reservation today in Menominee Territory. The Mohican tribe has an office in Williamstown and the lands in Troy, New York to maintain their local ties. We are in the watershed of the Quinnetuckwa River, or Connecticut River. Quinnetuckwa means long tidal river. And while this river has known several names by many different groups of people along its flowing path, Quinnetuckwa has stuck. It is important to remember that while indigenous communities have lived, gathered, farmed, hunted, and fished in this area for millennia, they are still here. Yes. Please get to know the indigenous people of your area and ask what you can do to lift and raise their voices, honor and respect their sovereignty. So in that spirit, I have three action items. First, recognize and make changes to the dominant narrative that glorifies colonization and genocide of indigenous peoples of this area. Be mindful that problematic terms like Pioneer Valley are a reminder of the legacy of dispossession, removal, and subsequent erasure. Second, Support Native organizations, such as the Native Land Conservancy, founded in 2012 in Mashpee, Massachusetts, and is the first Native-run land conservation group east of the Mississippi. Lastly, there are five bills that six tribes in Massachusetts support in legislation right now that address racist mascots in public schools, changing Columbus Day to Indigenous People Day, respecting our cultural heritage, creating appropriate educational curriculum in Massachusetts tribes, and a bill to create a permanent commission to ensure Native youth education. Please contact your local legislator through maindigenousagenda.org and encourage them to co-sponsor and support these bills. So, I think, um, I think about the last time I stood here with Drew, and honoring William Apis with the historical marker here in Coleraine. And I think about finally lifting Apis up out of this local obscurity and shedding this heavy cloak of invisibility and recognizing his invaluable contributions and insight 200 years later and how that gave me hope. And I think about how often I use Apis's words to punctuate how long Native people have been talking about? Who controls our identity? The misrepresentation of Indigenous people. I think about how often we have had to educate our government leaders to recognize tribal nations in the Commonwealth as sovereign nations. And I say this because just yesterday, testifying at the State House, supporting a bill concerning our identity, we needed the support of a few incredible senators and representatives to educate legislators on tribal sovereignty and how to respect our elected officials in a hearing. Our elected tribal leaders deserve the same respect as the Commonwealth's elected leaders. This respect and recognition is especially relevant when legislative committees hear issues concerning our identity, our representation, our civil rights, and infringements on our basic humanity as indigenous people. And these are some of the same issues today that APIS fought to bring awareness to almost 200 years ago, right? So I think, what would APIS do? <laughs> Huh? Yeah. Huh? I like to think that Apis would ask that we acknowledge the painful truth of our histories and move forward for all of humanity. 
I am grateful. Thank you. I'm grateful for Apis and his unapologetic, scathingly brilliant beacon of truth regarding some of the darkest chapters in American history. And in that spirit of moving forward for all of humanity worldwide, I would like to close my part once again with this quote from William Apis on Indian nullification. The laws were calculated to drive the tribes from their possessions and annihilate them as a people. And I would presume they would work the same effect upon any other people, for human nature is the same under skins of all colors. Degradation is degradation all the world over. Thank you very much for listening and celebrating William Apis. Just being here today is a huge win. Thank you. Good evening. I'm called Mother Bear. My ancestors are from Mashpee tribe. Um, my prayer tonight. Mana ka nikona ka kachi kutapatong tamawash. Nanaman wachi wami kakosanish makian means uh, creator and ancestors, thank you for everything you've given me. I also want to say how happy I am here to, today on our Independence Day. <laughs> um, I've always had a, um, a strong spiritual connection with William Epis, and um, I brought along my, I call it my magic cape, my, <laughs> my family tree, and some of the People in my family tree were contemporaries of his, and they worked with him on uh, Independence Declaration, and uh, I'm just happy to be here to share this um, honoring of him and as a way to say thank you for all he did for our tribe. Uh, you know? Yes. By unanimous vote of the Coleraine Select Board, a proclamation of William Apis Day. Whereas William Apis was a published author, public speaker, Methodist minister, and civil rights activist who was born in Coleraine, Massachusetts in 1798 and returned to Coleraine as an adult 20 years later to raise his family and begin his ministry, and who is believed to have delivered his first sermon at the schoolhouse on Catamount Hill in 1819. And, whereas William Apis of Pequot descent, with Blind Joe Amos, a Mashpee Wampanoag, co-authored the Mashpee Declaration of Independence on May 21st, 1833, asserting the sovereign rights of the Mashpee to land and to self-governance. And, whereas we wish to honor this history and the legacy of William Apis, who exhorted Americans to reconsider the long line of cultural productions that serve to disenfranchise Native people across the continent. And, whereas the Griswold Memorial Library at 12 Main Road serves as a site where William Apis is remembered with an historical marker, and whereas the library will host an event called William Apis Day on Friday, May 21st, 2021 at 6 p.m. And whereas we, the members of the select board, share in responsibilities to act as stewards of our land, water, and resources, 
and to improve our relationships to the tribal nations in Massachusetts. Now, therefore, the select board of the town of Coleraine, Massachusetts, does hereby de proclaim May 21st, William Apis Day. We urge the residents of Coleraine and surrounding towns to read works both written by and about Apis and to consider how they too can honor Apis brilliant legacy. Thank you. And just a personal note, it pleases me so much to live in a town that can have this kind of celebration and this kind of reconciliation with the people who were first here and remain among us. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm just going to say that uh, Dr. Margaret Bruchak is going to join us next. And she's going to, um, who is, um, well, we already introduced her with her credentials, but, but Margaret Bruchak um, of the Abenaki tribe, who was here when we first dedicated the, the, uh, the historical marker in 2018, and she read this dedicatory poem that she wrote for the occasion for William Apis, and she's going to read it to us, us again today. So thank you. on the raising of a marker to William Apis in the town of Coleraine. Awanina, who was this person, walking here so quietly in this forest? Kawani Wiwi Na Wizukwakan, do you know his name? The one who lived here in this place? Awaniuli, Wadakwahikana, whose books are these? Have you read his words? How could he have been forgotten? Who claimed this history, cleared this slate, denied the traces of color in this town? Perhaps everybody knew, but nobody talked. Wak to wak wa me, white men think they know all. Poshi mutong kuk wa nak mani to, some never listen to God. Katsi wak not we are no all, half of what they say is not true. Piyok. Come, warm yourselves by this new fire. Remember our old friend William. He sought fellowship here in these hills among strangers. For a time, when the wrong road led into the swamps, he was shut out from the light of heaven. But when patience found him, the earth grew firm beneath his feet and the smallest bit of starlight led him into the light of day. Here with family, they rejoiced together. Here in company, the faithful sang together, son of the forest, man of the people, child of Coleraine. Akosi walk, a good man is not many. Natsquad nutkopi kumsquad, looking you cannot find him. Anyone could read, then they will know. Spirit knows everything. This Pequot man, he was something special. If you have the courage to follow his track from Coleraine to Colchester, off to Battle in Plattsburgh, through the Singing Rock in the Bay of Kinte, to a pulpit in Providence, to a lecture hall in Boston, to a stump in Mashpee, and back to Coleraine in no particular order, you just might catch a glimpse of his spirit. And if you followed him into the swamps, he just might take your hand to lead you out again. So let us find fellowship here in these hills among friends. Let us remember our old friend William. 
Ipawakpatawosh bring tobacco, offer smoke and prayers. His old house was up on this hill. He heard voices in the music of the trees. We hear ourselves in the rhythm of his words. He spoke to us while we dreamed. We speak to his memory now. Yokisquikon, this day it is good. This is a good day. Son of the forest, man of the people, child of Coleraine. Next off, we're going to invite Barry O'Connell up to the microphone. And Barry O'Connell from uh, Amherst College, who was the first person to collect William Apis's works together in a published volume. And, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about that. So, for Barry. Um, there's a way in which I belong here only under false pretenses. Uh, it's William Apis that enables me to be here, not that I enable William Apis to be here. Though I did many years ago now come across him in a German anthology of short prose and wondered who this person was and began to Xerox of the few things I could find to do in teacher workshops until one day, an elementary school teacher said to me, I hate Xeroxes. Would you just put together a book of his writing? And I said, well, I don't think I can do that. And I didn't think I could, but I started and eventually found, I think, everything. And from the very beginning, reading Apis's work reminded me of who and what matters most in American history. Indeed, his name had disappeared pretty much uh, for over 150 years. And when I did the book, I thought, well, it's a little bit that I can do by doing the book, but not much will happen with it. Within two years, William Apis was being taught in virtually every graduate school, college, and university in the United States. That was not my doing, that was his doing. People began to read him and read him and tell other people, and so in time, he became again a vivid presence in America. His way with words is especially astonishing. He had no real formal education. Six harvests led to winter school, and that was it. He couldn't read or write when he left his indenture in servitude in Connecticut. So one of the mysteries of his life, and it's a wonderful mystery, is how did he learn to be such a good writer, such a great speaker. Uh, when I first started working on him, I was told by several senior historians who will remain unnamed, that of course he didn't write a word of what was published as his, that others did. But I'd studied everything else, and there's no one else in the period who writes vaguely like him. So what you read is him, and if it's not him, it's no white person. It's somebody else. Um, and one of the things he does, and I'll end here, that is really so important, and we may miss how remarkable, is that his writing interrogates white people, unlike what white people have done routinely with people of color. In our culture, it is still the case that people of color are interrogated. What Apis does is he turns the tables completely and asks what 
white people do and why and who the criminals are and he uses that language so there are parts of him that speak right into today and ask those of us who are white to inter interrogate ourselves and to reinforce all native people as the original settlers and makers of this society. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Barry. Um, <laughs> That's, that's, that is a great story. Um, we're going to, uh, so we have just a, a couple more uh, speakers, including myself, coming up. Uh, but we're going to invite um, Jim Peters to the microphone right now from the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, and he's going to say a few words for us as well. Good evening. Um, so happy to be here and see you all. And I'd like to thank you all for having this, this event and attributing, giving a tribute to him uh, for all that he has done. You know, like, um, and um, I just, when, when I was a child, my uh, great grandmother made me read uh, The Son of the Forest, you know, whether I liked it or not. And, uh, and it was, I think it was a little bit before me, you know, like, but as I have grown into it, over the years, I've, I've read most of his stuff at Barry's book as well, and um, it's a uh, yeah, it it's something that um, can't put words to about what it means to to us, you know, um, for what he had done to uh, help us change our direction. You know, we were in the um, the uh, the directions of uh, acculturation. You know, like in even though we fought very hard to uh, try to correct the wrongs that were happening to us, uh, that we didn't have the uh, the knowledge at that time. As a matter of fact, um, when I think about you know what Massachusetts has done to us over time, and, and I and it, it's kind of awkward for me to say that my uh, I'm the uh, executive director of the Massachusetts Commission on Indian Affairs, and I've been doing that for about 20 years, and it's given me um, um, some insight as to you know, the game that we are find ourselves in. But um, we didn't have the education, and, um, and I, I think in 1789 they passed a law that, uh, by penalty of death, uh, that not to teach the Indians to read and write. And um, but you know, despite that, you know, like we we had tried to do what we could uh, with the help of some of the overseers and so forth that was um, speculating on our land and so forth, but um, uh, or helping us to to understand um, what it was like. You know, you have to realize the uh, the differences of our culture versus the uh, the European culture that came here. You know, we were people of the land. You know, um, we only took what we needed. You know, uh, we had respect for all living things. And to have people coming, you know, who had a material, you know, uh, interest in what we had there, it was very, very difficult. You know, like, we found ourselves with having the, um, around the time that William Ace came, um, we were probably had some of the, uh, the the last land that had real trees on it. Um, the, most of the waterfront was clear cut and um, and the resources were, were being challenged. So um, so you can imagine, you know, the, in, the intent of, uh, of, you know, uh, securing our land from us and so forth. And um, so, um, you know, I think of the years growing up in my short lifetime, you know, I've, uh, I've had the opportunity to live in a community when it was only us, um, primarily, you know, we were the majority of the people, um, all of my cousins did all of the, the town functions uh, as we tried to learn what they were. Um, we didn't really have a, um, um, a tax base there, but uh, we volunteered, uh, you know, you grew up with a, a life of uh, volunteering and giving to the community the best you could. And, um, and and not you know being humble you know like and just taking accepting what was there and, and so forth so um, and then having that environment I, I have to uh, attribute that to what William Ates had done for us to to actually help us to 
um, understand um, how to um, uh, confront the laws that are being, you know, placed upon us, and um, and working with us to, you know, uh, demand that you know our kids can be educated and so forth. And, and still, we we fought that fight, and it's still going on to to be able to catch up, you know, like and, and learn how to actually, you know, um, play the game of of America. But um, he contributed to that, and, and and the fight goes on, you know, like and it's been a battle all the way, you know, like and we're still fighting for um, our rights, for um, our ability to leave something for our future generations. And you know, we've been on this land for thousands of years, and, and it's been a challenge in the last 400 years. Um, and, um, but we'll continue on. And commemorations such as this, you know, like are very appreciative of the, uh, what you're doing. You know, it, it's um, a place that we can point to and saying, yes, they understood. They understood what we was going through, and, and they honor that man who came to our town and helped us to um, to pull our bootstraps up and, and continue on um, and continue the fight. So thank you. Learning to play the game of America. That's uh, something we're all trying to figure out these days. I want to thank everybody for coming this evening and, um, and, and bearing with us through these many um, addresses. It's so important that we have all of these people here to come talk. And we didn't know everybody who was going to be able to get together for this event tonight to speak. So we're, we're so lucky to have the Mashpee Wampanoag joining us and, and Jim Peters to speak and, and the elders to give our, a blessing. And, um, and so I'm grateful for all of that. I want to also say thanks to Barry O'Connell for coming up here. Um, you know, Barry introduced himself and, and, and told us how he came to this work. But he underplayed the extent to which he really helped lay the foundation for, for everybody who's done work on William Apis um, over the last 20 years since he first published that book. Well, it's almost 30 years now, believe it or not, since 1992. And, uh, and, and he laid the intellectual foundation for me to do this work by, by collecting Apis's work, and not just by bringing it together, but by doing it in such a respectful way um, at a time when, when a lot of scholars didn't know what to do with this material. And I don't know that anybody has done it, uh, certainly, People have done it worse. Not many people have, have been able to rise above what Barry accomplished in that original um, text, um, collection of, of, of Apis's works. Marge Bruchak, I just can't say how grateful I am for you to come and read your poetry for us again at this event, um, your occasional poem of William Apis. I remember when she wrote it, I asked her, well, she, she suggested that could be her contribution, and, and when she wrote the poem, she, um, she emailed it to me, and, and I read it, and I, I, I cried when I read that poem the first time. Uh, it brought tears to my eyes, and it happens again when I hear her reading it live. Um, just quickly, I want to thank... Um, Nancy Turkle, and, and of course, Chelsea Jordan Makeley, who brought all of this together. Um, Erica Wheeler is going to bring us out with a song in just a couple of minutes. And I want to thank Rhonda Anderson, who um, she has been really by my side uh, trying to bring this whole thing together uh, since I first went to the Coleraine Board of Selectmen, and, and she joined me there, as did Erica for that matter, and I was just so happy to have you guys with me and, and supporting me. When we first brought, sort of, we, we had this idea and, and we never knew the town would support it in quite this way, and so we're just so pleased. So thank you for being here once again. I think I covered everybody there. I hope I did. Um, you know, Rhonda, I've, I've heard her speak on many occasions, and she's been a fierce advocate for uh, indigenous people um, in this region and, and everywhere else, really. But, um, but as fierce as, of an advocate as she is, uh, she's also, you should know that she started the West County Kindness Project. And I love that Coleraine has a, a county kindness project, right? I don't know how many places can boast that, but, but that gives you a sense of, of, of Rhonda's spirit. So I am going to try and keep this brief. Um, I want to talk today about hospitality. And to sort of understand why, I just want to preface it with the fact that it was 
right around this time, um, on this date that we're celebrating, uh, maybe a few days earlier, that William Apis first came to um, Mashpee on Cape Cod, and he was welcomed there. Um, if you read his text, uh, his particularly Indian nullification, which he published in 1834, and he Tells, he, he gives us the account of what happened in Mashpee when he came there, and he makes it sound like he came there by accident, as though he just sort of stumbled into town and, and all of these things just happened all by themselves. But he didn't stumble into town. He was invited there. And in fact, not only was he invited, um, he was accompanied on his trip there, at least according to um, stories that I've been told by, by George Oakley of the Mashpee, and, and he was brought there, and, and, and there was an idea that, that he had a certain expertise and ability that, that, that they could use and that he could bring to help them. And he was shown hospitality when he got there, and not only was he welcomed there, but he was, he, he was so welcomed that he decided that he would bring his family there as well to settle, and this would be his new home. And so, although the day that we're celebrating today, the Mashpee, uh, the so-called Mashpee Declaration of Independence, happened on May 21st. It was actually on June 18th, 1833, when William Apis came to Mashpee with his family. And he took a ferry into Mashpee. He, his family was up north, somewhere around the Boston area. And he took a ferry in, and they landed somewhere around Barnstable, um, which is just a little ways off from Mashpee, the large uh, uh, township of that area. And I just want to read to you what he wrote about his coming to Barnstable at that time. He said, Here we found ourselves breathing a new atmosphere. The people were very little prepossessed in our favor, and we certainly owe them small thanks on the score of hospitality. We succeeded in obtaining the shelter of an old stable for two nights by paying two dollars. We applied to one individual for accommodations during that time for one of our party who was sick, but we were refused. He said he had no room. If any white man should come to Mashpee and ask hospitality for a night or two, I do not believe that one of the whole tribe would turn him from his door, savages though they be. Does not he better deserve the name who took from us two dollars for sleeping in his stable? This usage made me think that in this part of New England, prejudice was strong against the poor children of the woods, and that any aid we might receive must come from the more hospitable Indians, among whom we arrived on the 21st and rested till the 25th. We regarded ourselves in some sort as a tribe of Israelites, suffering under the rod of despotic pharaohs, for thus far our cries and remonstrances had been of no avail. We were compelled to make our bricks without straw. So William Apis was shown hospitality when he came to Mashpee. He was not shown hospitality by the white community, but he was by the Mashpee community. And this is always part of Apis's rhetorical strategies is, is how he takes these ideas. Christ, hospitality, is a, of course, is a, is a Christian concept, but it's also very much an indigenous concept. And, and he was shown hospitality by the indigenous community, not the Christian community. Um, and, and he kind of reverses perhaps his audience's expectations when he presents that material. But I want to speak of hospitality as a belief system, as a, as a, as a tradition that is deeply embedded in Native culture. And one of the ways we can see this for ourselves is just to look at Western history and to go to the journals of, for instance, Christopher Columbus, who when he first came here, he writes in his own journals that he was greeted by peaceful, um, peaceful, obviously what he called Indians, who came to him, they fed him, they welcomed him, they let him and, and his, his crew, uh, they gave them a place to stay. And, and Columbus said not only they were peaceful, it seemed as though they were people, to Columbus at least, who, who did not know of warfare. In other words, they showed hospitality. And Columbus went so far in his understanding of things, which I don't think was the greatest, quite frankly, but <laughs> went so far as to say that, that these, what he thought of as simple native people, even thought of him and the Europeans as gods. I don't know where he got that idea necessarily. <laughs> But 
there is that Western tradition that when a stranger comes to your door, you show them kindness because they might be a god. And, and I wonder if there's something of that in that tradition, that you treat people the way that you would want to be treated because you don't know who they are and you don't know why they've come, but you owe them at least that. And, and maybe in that sense, they were treated like gods. I think it's well known to most of us that when the Puritans first came to Patuxet and Cape Cod, and they were greeted by the Wampanoags. And they were also welcomed when they came here. And the local Wampanoags uh, taught, not only welcomed them on the land, but, but taught them how to plant. And we all know this story. This is, this is part of our own sort of indoctrination uh, in elementary school into the Thanksgiving story and all of these things. But, but what we sometimes miss about that is this, this deeply embedded custom of hospitality and, and that a, a, a custom and a tradition that I see repeated over one account to the next account to the next account um, with every explorer from Europe who came to these shores, they were treated with hospitality. They were fed and they would not have survived without the help of indigenous people who helped to feed them. So let's think about colonialism for a second because what is colonialism except the very opposite of hospitality. It is the antithesis of hospitality. It suggests that you come to a place and you attach yourself to it. Um, my uncle Ernie, who was an immigrant here himself um, from Italy, used to say that guests are like fish. Um, you know, they're good for about three days and then they start to stink. <laughs> The colonists came and they attached themselves to the host body and they didn't leave. They, they stayed, they populated, they expanded, they took land, they extracted the resources from the land and, and, and they continued to move in that direction in a most inhospitable way. Colonialism is in fact the opposite of hospitality. And such were the conditions in Mashpee when William Apis came there in May of 1833, um, almost exactly 188 years ago to this date. And he said, or he wrote when he came there, he said, I knew that no people on earth were more neglected, yet whenever I attempted to supply their wants, I was opposed and obstructed by the whites around them. When he says they were neglected, I think this is a history that we have neglected. Most of us don't know. What was life like for native people in New England, in Massachusetts, in the 1830s? Um, it's not something that we give a lot of thought to because a lot of us have pretty much been taught that native people weren't here. And, and maybe they're, they're still not here. And, and that's why the presence that we have here today is, is so important. Um, so I'm going to tell you just a tiny bit about that, that, that history that we don't know. Native people, like the people at Mashpee, but also the people at Pequot, where William Apis was from, and the Mohegan, and the Narragansett, um, who used to be the stewards of large tracts of geography here in New England, were reduced to very small parcels of land. And it was hard to, to even pull together a living um, for, for all these people in such a small space. But beyond that, they there were appointed overseers to look after them and ostensibly um, who were supposed to safeguard their needs because native people were supposedly too simple to take care of themselves in this system of thought. Um, and what that meant basically because these, these overseers had incredible power over the lives of native people and basically reduced these native people to a position of serfdom on their own lands. Um, they were, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what those powers were. They had these powers. Um, they could, they could at any time rent off whichever lands they chose um, to white people in the community to farm on or to, or to use and, and collect money from. They could sell off resources from the Mashpee woodlots um, or, or corn or anything else that was growing. Um, and, and white people thought it was that they were entitled to come in and take those, those, um, those resources for their own use. They could collect all debts, um, real or imagined. They could sell the lumbers and other lumber and other resources 
um, from that property. They could demand control of all property and wages that Mashpee people made. When you went out and you worked those wages, the overseers could command control of it, and they did do this. If you went off on a whaling ship, the captain didn't pay you, he paid the overseers, and the overseers could dole out whatever percentage of that they saw fit. The overseers could settle all disputes, and they did, mostly to their favor and not to the benefit of the Mashpee. They, could, they stood in proxy for Mashpee people in all lawsuits. They could bind out the Mashpee children to labor, and if they deemed a Mashpee adult was uh, unfit um, for whatever reasons, um, deemed incapable of supporting themselves, they could bind them out as well, which basically meant that the white community all around benefited from the free labor of Mashpee individuals, which was really a condition, um, when you take it all into account, a condition of slavery. Apis said, and I'm going to repeat the exact same quote that Rhonda read, but uh, you know, we're, we're drawn to great minds think alike, I guess. The laws were calculated to drive the tribes from their possessions and annihilate them as a people. And I presume they would have the same effect upon any other people, for human nature is the same under skins of all colors. Degradation is degradation the world over. So William Apis came to Mashpee and on May 21st, they called a meeting, and the leaders and the elders of the community came together, and they drew up these proclamations. And I'll just read to you briefly what the proclamations were. The first one was that Apis asked to be adopted into the tribe. The reason that he asked this is because in his travels as an itinerant Methodist minister, William Apis um, had met resistance wherever he went, and it was easy to vilify him for the outside community to vilify him by saying, he's an outsider, he's an interloper, he's not one of their people, and that they could sort of peel him off that way and attack him personally. And he realized this over time during his advocacy with various indigenous communities, and so he said to the Mashpee, I'd like you to, to adopt me and my family into the tribe, and then we can move from there. And so he did this, and they came together, and they wrote down this, this declaration, resolved that we as a tribe will rule ourselves and have the right to do so, for all men are born free and equal, says the constitution of the country. Resolved that we will not permit any white man to come upon our plantation to cut or carry off wood or hay or any other article without our permission after the 1st of July next. And resolved that we will put said resolution in force after that date, July next, with the penalty of binding and throwing them from the plantation if they will not stay away without. Now, they knew full well that the people in the white community were going to come back and take wood and, and do the things they'd always done. Part of the genius of what Apis did here was not only to make this proclamation, but to broadcast it to the larger regional community, to have it printed in the newspapers in the Boston area and in the Cape Cod area. Um, and Apis had cultivated allies among the press, including William Lloyd Garrison, who was the editor of the, the Abolitionist, which was the major organ for the abolitionist movement in America at the time. Um, and by making it so public and so transparent, uh, it, it, it meant none of this could happen in secret or in the dark. The world was now looking in on it. And when those community members from the white community came onto Mashpee lands, it was the Samson brothers on July 1st, to take the wood that they had been in the habit of taking for themselves to, to their lumberyard and selling, uh, the Mashpee were there to stop them. And they formed a circle around them and said, we would like you to unload that wood. And they did it in a peaceful manner. And William Apis was very, very careful to make clear to everybody that we must show no sign of aggression. This is, this, this language didn't exist at the time, but this was a peaceful act of civil disobedience. He understood that if, if any act of hostility was perceived on the part of the Mashpee, that that would give license to anybody in the white community to bring the full force of their power down upon them and crush them. It was essential that they remain peaceful. And this is precisely what they did. Even despite this and the continued peaceful actions that they organized together, uh, William Apis was finally jailed for his actions. He was thrown in jail. He spent a month in jail. Um, the charges, and this is interesting, the first charge was for trespassing. 
I want you to appreciate that he was trespassing on Mashpee land. Um, not according to the Mashpee, but according to the overseers who could decide all cases and disputes. He was also accused of inciting a riot. And again, let's emphasize that this was from start to finish an entirely peaceful operation. Um, inciting a riot, and, and when you think about, you know, today when you have peaceful protesters going out in the streets and fighting injustice here that's continuing in the U.S. at this very moment, and these are the very sort of charges that are brought against them, right? That, that it's the people who are peacefully resisting against the irresponsible use of force and power. It's the people who are peacefully resisting that who are inciting a riot. Um, it's just amazing when you begin to dig into this to realize how these dynamics are, are not new. They've been going on forever. And William Apis was, in a sense, pioneering ways to resist these, these forces. Or if not pioneering them, he, was, he, he had learned them um, from people who had already been practicing them and figured out ways to put them into action and, and make them effective. And, and ultimately, Without being able to go into the whole history of this, William Apis finally, he did spend a month in jail. While he was in jail, he wrote a memorial, the Mashpee Memorial, which was a long document which, which, which outlined the abuses that the Mount Mashpee people had suffered, the rights that were supposedly guaranteed them, and the original charter statements that had begun to form the tribe, uh, the, 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 I should say, the, the reservation upon which they were living on. And, and he took this memorial and he brought it all around uh, New England. He went everywhere in about a six month period, all the way up to Bangor, Maine, all the way down to uh, uh, Martha's Vineyard and, and Connecticut and, and, and New York and traveled around on foot, I presume. I really don't know. He doesn't tell us how he traveled. And, and he, he, he put the word out so that by the end of it, he brought so much publicity to this cause that the Massachusetts General Court almost had no choice but to guarantee the Mashpee the rights that had been denied them up until that point. Um, Paula Peters from the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, who's uh, been the tribal historian uh, for many years, I'm not sure if she still is, but in a recent interview she said um, that she sees her own work today as a continuation of what William Apis accomplished. She said, because what Apis was so adept at doing was saying, we are still here. We are still valid. And so hospitality. Why do we honor William Apis here today? Apis was not a town father here in Coleraine. He made no great improvements, economic or otherwise. He wasn't a job creator. He didn't build buildings, start factories, or endow libraries, like some people. All of these doors were closed to William Apis. He had no way to have a foot in that door. He had no access to those channels of power. But it did turn out that the Methodist Church opened the door just a crack for him. And in fact, they didn't even open it. He spent 10 years fighting to get that door open. But once he did get it open just a crack, managed to stick his foot in there, and he was ordained as a minister. And using that pulpit, William Apis was able to, to speak um, to large audiences, white audience, native audiences, audiences of people of color. He drew crowds of hundreds of people at the height of his career as an activist. And doing so, this was his contribution. This was his accomplishment. He spoke for the disenfranchised. He gave hope to the subjected. He effected change in the lives of native people. And he launched a social justice campaign that in many ways was the first of its kind. And so 223 years after he was born in these hills somewhere here in Coleraine, um, I want to thank the town of Coleraine for paying tribute to its native son. I want to thank the town of Coleraine for your hospitality in making this a place of welcome for Native people today, for opening your door so that the story of William Apis might be heard, and doing it in such intentional and unambiguous terms. Um, because I forgot to mention when I was thanking people, Joe Kirtland, for your um, proclamation. Where is Joe? Here. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm looking in the wrong direction. Um, and, 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 and for what a, a forceful and an intentional and unambiguous proclamation 
it was. You guys are doing good work here today. Um, and you know, while I'm at it, I also should think that Lisa Brooks is here today too, without whom none of this would have been possible either. So I want to thank Colerain for their, their hospitality. And I also want us to remember that the earth is also our host and that we should show gratitude um, for all that it gives to us. William Apis wrote, Yes, in vain have I looked for the Christian to take me by the hand and bid me welcome to his cabin, as my fathers did them before we were born. But Colerain, you have done that today, and I would like to thank you for your hospitality. Happy William Apis Day, everybody. I have William Apis pins. William Apis Day pins, please come up and help yourself to a pin. have heard the question tonight, what would William Apis do? And now is the time for you all to have an opportunity to reflect on that. Rhonda Anderson has offered Rhonda Anderson has offered several examples of ways that you can honor William Apis legacy by supporting legislature in Massachusetts now. You've heard other ideas as well, especially about hospitality. We're passing around some William Apes pledge cards. Can I give some to somebody to pass around? So you all, many people have asked um, who designed our beautiful poster and I want to acknowledge Nancy Jerkle for having put these together. We'd like everybody to take one of these home. Today is not a one-off, and that was a part of us seeking to declare this as William Apes Day, that we can make this an ongoing commitment. But this pledge card is to be your reminder that you can take a moment, please, and reflect on how you'll honor Apes' legacy. You can take this home and hang it in a space that you'll look at it and be reminded of your pledge. We also invite you to share with others what you'll do to honor APES legacy. You can use hashtag William APES Day. You could leave it with us here at the library and we'll post it on display for everybody else. Um, but we're gonna leave about, well, a comfortable space here for everybody to reflect. Feel free to um, share with your neighbors around you. Thank you for passing those out, folks. And we, do we want to, yeah, and Erica, do you want to come up and lead us in the song? Okay. Thank you, everybody. Nice. Oh, look at this. We're like uh, butterflies with our droopy wings, our first event in Coleraine. <laughs> it's so good to be here in our town. See you all. Oh my god. So, this is a beautiful event, and as it was going on, I was just thinking about coming to our senses, coming into our senses, and thinking about the birds that I'm hearing singing, and the sunlight this afternoon, this evening, and how I always like to think about people who've come before us have heard these same birds on a May evening, and felt this sweet evening come, come into the darkness here. And I want to sing a song called Quiet Hills. This song is by Claudia Schmidt and dedicated to all the people who have lived here and have loved these hills over all this time. And before I do, I want to just mention bringing this all together. I'm, uh, it's been such a moving thing and I can't believe that it's here in this town. I'm so, I'm so happy for it. And thank you for all the work, everyone, that, um, that made it so we can honor someone that we didn't know that much about. Um, there's a book, uh, Mayflower, by Nathaniel Philbrick, that I, there's a quote in it about when the pilgrims came and they were walking with the Nipmuc and the Namaskit, and they're walking through the, through the land there, and everywhere that they go, the, um, the native people are stopping, and he says, so Winslow and Homer, the pilgrims say, 
that it's that they stopped at each place that something of great significance happened and it was as if in the land were all these memory holes where something had happened and um and i think of how many of those memory holes we don't know about because they're under houses or shopping malls and there's so many memory holes that we just don't know about but this william apis and the story of his life here is a memory hole that we know about and are keeping that memory alive. So I just want to say thank you for everyone for helping that happen. All right, and um, so sing Quiet Hills and for all of the people who've loved these hills. It goes like this. <clears throat> there is a darkness in these hills, I am not afraid. There is a darkness in these hills, I am not afraid. There is a darkness in these hills, or some may tremble. I am still, no, I say, hopeless in these quiet hills. And there is a darkness in the land, I seek the taste of hope. There is a darkness in the land, I seek the taste of hope. And there is a darkness in the land with more sorrow than we can stand. But I say, hope lives in these quiet hills. And there is a darkness in my heart. The taste of hope is sweet. Yeah, there is a darkness in my heart. The taste of hope is sweet. And there is a darkness in the land with more sorrow than we can stand. But I say, hope lives in these quiet hills. Yeah, hope lives in these quiet hills. Mm, hope lives in these quiet hills. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. trustees, um, I wanted to say that we were um, honored to uh, host this event today, here. <laughs> and, um, and we have gifts of uh, commemorative um, framed posters that we wanted to, to give to all the presenters um, for their beautiful words and song. And um, we, some of them will be coming, and uh, some of them will be presenting today. And uh, let's see, I also wanted to say that we have um, some succotash and sassafras tea and uh, lemon water over here, oops, over here. Um, and please um, remember to um, keep dis your distance when you take your masks off. And, um, and I just wanted to thank everyone and um, see you next year <laughs> and maybe before. I also just wanted to encourage everybody, if you haven't had a chance to check out the historical marker that we put up in 2018 and, and take a look at it and read it. That's here forever. It's yours to enjoy. Thanks everybody. tonight um, there was just one other thing that I said that I would mention um, besides thanks to everybody I just couldn't say that enough um, but if you've made the trip from out of town and you are very hungry uh, the Catamount Country Store is serving local beef hamburgers tonight and they are open and expecting you so, um, <laughs> thank you again for coming out we hope to see you again soon